The captain major of the Portuguese fleet climbed to the bridge of his flagship. The scene before him was gruesome. His armada had established naval superiority over the harbor of the Indian city of Calicut. All around him were the destroyed, broken remains of a Muslim fleet. Hundreds of dead bodies still drifted in the water. Some of the ships, that is, the ones that the Portuguese had not sent to the bottom of the harbor, were still burning, billowing smoke into the humid air of the Malabar coast. Not far away was a trading outpost that Portugal had just established. Now, it was nothing more than a shattered ruin. Two nights before, an overwhelming Muslim force had attacked it, burned it to the ground, and killed nearly everyone inside. Diplomacy had obviously failed. Now there was only a sense of vengeance that was left. Meanwhile, during these two critical days, the Hindu king of Calicut had not sent a message indicating that he had either supported or, more importantly, denounced the attack on the outpost. His royal silence for the men of Portugal implied that he was guilty of conspiring with the Muslims, and thus he too would be held accountable. The Captain Major was a man by the name of Pedro Alvarez Cabral. He had his fleet towed by longboats as close to the city as the shallow waters of the harbor would allow. While the Portuguese ships were being brought in, a vast portion of the population of the city had come out to the beach. They had come out to retrieve the bodies of those that were killed and to behold this large fleet that had come to anchor so close to them. The people of Calicut, men, women, and children, watched with surprise as a line of innumerable cannons were brought to bear on all of the ships. The city of Calicut was targeted. The immense crowd just happened to be in the line of sight. Cabral waited for a moment. He wanted to see the sun begin to climb in the eastern sky. Then, turning slowly to his men, he gave a single order. He shouted the words, Open fire! The command echoed down the line for all of his men to hear. They knew at that moment that there would be no turning back. Gaspar da Gama was dressed in a regal white linen shirt. It had become essentially his trademark. It did, after all, complement his other fine clothing, which was needed as he was on his way to see the King of Portugal. He was an intellectually refined man who commanded incredible charisma. He also happened to speak at least a dozen languages, including Latin, Castilian, Portuguese, Arabic, Italian, and several dialects of southern India. In time, he'd also pick up a little Swahili. His knowledge of the Indian Ocean made him invaluable as the ideal diplomat and guide, not to mention also being a great interpreter. Over the years, he had gained an impressive survival trait, that is, having the ability to charm just about anyone. At the same time, he carried about him this aura of being enigmatic and mysterious. No one really knew where he was originally from. He said he was born of Jewish parents in the Kingdom of Poland, circa 1444-ish, but others were convinced that he was from Bosnia, Grenada, or perhaps even Alexandria. It was said that he had fled Europe to escape religious persecution, then converted to Islam, and in time had come into the good graces of the Sultan of Goa, who he then served as an ambassador. How this happened, no one really knows for sure. The story he gave seemed to keep changing. What is known with more certainty is that Gaspar met Vasco da Gama, the first European to discover the sea passage to India, on his return trip from Calicut in 1498. At that time, Gaspar had been dispatched by the Sultan of Goa to lure the Portuguese fleet into a trap, but he was discovered, taken prisoner, beaten up a bit, converted to Christianity, unleashed his charm, and thus managed to befriend and then accompany Vasco da Gama all 12,000 miles back to Portugal. Nigel Cliff, in his book The Last Crusade, speaks of how he got his name. Quote, He took the name Gaspar after one of the three eastern kings who had followed the Star of Bethlehem, and da Gama after his captor, torturer, interrogator, and now godfather. End quote. Gaspar immediately became one of King Manuel's favorites. The sovereign of Portugal would often take his counsel. Now, it needs to be said that King Manuel was 
firmly convinced that the inhabitants of India were Christian. Indeed, part of the reason why the Portuguese king had spent so much money on his expeditions was an attempt to reach out to the, quote, Christian kings of India to have them join the West in their ongoing crusades against Islam. Gaspar da Gama knew that in reality there weren't that many Christians in the East at all. But the man also wanted to survive and keep his head. So when he arrived in the king's presence and was asked about the status of Christian rulers in the subcontinent, he responded by saying that there were 14 Indian states, of which 12 were Christian, mainly the larger ones, who together could field an army of, oh, I don't know, 223,000 foot soldiers, at least 15,000 cavalry, and 12,400 war elephants, who each carried a dozen men in a wooden castle on their backs, and charged their enemies with five swords attached to their tusks. King Manuel was blown away. With that kind of firepower and the wealth of the spice trade, Islam wouldn't stand a chance. The king was overjoyed with this news, and thus he personally brought Gaspar to see the vast new armada that he had built. Whereas before Vasco da Gama was dispatched with four ships and approximately 170 men, now there would be 13 ships and 1,500 men, of which 600 were soldiers. On board was the best nautical equipment, ravished gifts for the kings of India, and some of the finest sailors that Portugal could produce. The entire enterprise was backed up not only by royal funds, but also by investors from Florence and surprisingly Genoa who had turned from competitor to collaborator. But the most important thing the Armada carried was knowledge. The departure time was now dictated by the rhythm of the monsoons, not by the estimates of the royal astrologers. The sea route would be based on the circular winds of the South Atlantic, which had been proven effective by the prior voyages of Bartholomew Diaz and Vasco da Gama. Leading the ships were experienced men like Pedro Escobar and Nicolas Coelho, who had journeyed with Vasco da Gama and had seen India. Indeed, even Bartholomew Diaz, the first European to round the tip of Africa, and his brother Diogo Diaz had joined the venture. Of course, Gaspar da Gama, with his knowledge and experience, would also be coming along. Now all that was left was to find someone capable to run the entire show. The man chosen as leader of the expedition was Pedro Álvarez Cabral. He was a fidalgo, that is, a person of noble birth. He was born in 1467 in Belmonte, Portugal and became a member of the royal court, where he obtained an excellent education. By 1497, he was anointed as a Knight of the Order of Christ. On one end, he was considered to be generous, prudent, and tolerant. On the other, he was also deemed to be vain and would react with aggression if his honor was at stake. This was a man who was not afraid to use violence. Cabral was not a sailor. He was chosen for his status as a nobleman and the fact that he had been groomed to be a diplomat. King Manuel had given him a set of instructions on how he should approach the King of Calicut, who again everyone in Portugal still figured was a Christian. Nigel Cliff in The Last Crusade elaborates on these royal orders, quote, Cabral was to convey a message in private. He was to request that the king of Calicut, known as the Zamorin, was to simply banish every Muslim from his harbors. The Portuguese would henceforth supply the commodities that the Arabs had brought only better and cheaper. King Manuel gave his commander a final top secret order. If the Zamorin didn't quietly consent to trade solely with the Portuguese, Cabral should make cruel war upon him for his injurious conduct to Vasco da Gama. The Zamorin, again the King of Calicut, might have been a fellow Christian, but he was clearly misguided, and King Manuel was in a hurry. Cabral's orders also instructed him to establish relations with the other Christian states of India and to do all he could to interfere with Muslim shipping. End quote. The Armada of 13 ships departed from Balim on March 9, 1500. After a royal celebration, the king personally accompanied the sailors to the shore. From Portugal, they made a direct course for the Cape Verde Islands, but ominously along the way, in fair weather, one of the ships disappeared with all hands, never to be seen again. Just beyond the Cape Verde Islands, using the knowledge of his predecessors, Cabral then directed his ships to head southwest. Thus, he wanted to begin the counterclockwise looping maneuver of the South Atlantic to hopefully land them beyond the Cape of Good Hope. 
but departing at this latitude, the looping maneuver that he would employ would be much bigger. On April 21st, 1500, several days into the southwest bearing, an unknown land was unexpectedly spotted. A chronicler described it as a large mountain, very high and round, with lowlands to the south, and flatlands with great groves of trees. As they approached, they soon discovered that it was inhabited. Nicholas Coelho was dispatched to make first contact. Roger Crowley in the book The Conquerors described the scene, quote, this landfall proved to be as peaceful as it was unexpected. The naked inhabitants were vividly different from the tribes that were encountered on the shores of Africa. The people appeared to be docile. They danced the Portuguese bagpipe music and were willing to mimic the actions of the mass performed on the tropic shore. This place, which they christened the land of the true cross, had plentiful water and fruit and strange animals. They ate the flesh of the manatee, which they described as being as large as a barrel with a head like that of a pig and small eyes. They saw brilliantly colored parrots, some as large as hens. A ship was immediately dispatched to sail back to Portugal with news for King Manuel of this new land that they had just discovered and claimed for the crown." End quote. Unknown to Pedro Cabral and his men at the time, this was not a large island, but rather the continent of South America, and the land that they had arrived at would one day be known as Brazil. For several days, the Armada took in provisions, made repairs, and conducted the first mass on the continent. On May 2nd, 1500, the voyage continued. After 10 days of sailing, a comet was seen in the sky. It was described as having a very long tail in the direction of Arabia. It would serve as an ominous sign. 12 days later, on May 24th, Cabral's fleet entered the high-pressure zone of the South Atlantic. A strong wind pushed them east, but near the Cape of Good Hope, the Armada sailed directly into a fierce storm. It came on so suddenly that no one was prepared. In the fury of the tempest, four ships were lost, including the Carrack that carried Bartholomew Diaz. He was never seen again, and ironically, he died at the Cape that he had discovered. After some time, the remaining seven ships moved up the eastern coast of Africa and managed to reassemble on June 20th off the coast of Mozambique. But shortly thereafter, Diogo Diaz and his ship got separated from the Armada, drifting off to the east. For several days, he attempted to find his countrymen, but instead, he stumbled into a large island. Diogo Diaz would go down in history as the first Portuguese explorer to set eyes on Madagascar. Diogo continued north in an attempt to find the Armada. He would sail past the Horn of Africa and into the Gulf of Aden, which was another place that no Portuguese had ever sailed. Here, he was trapped by the winds and attacked by pirates. Thirst and starvation reduced his crew to a fraction of their original number. With these losses, Diogo was forced to give up the chase. He turned south, limped away, and eventually made the vast, long journey back to Lisbon. Meanwhile, Cabral and the remaining six ships made their way along the African coast. The Sultan of Mozambique would give them a cold reception. His city was, after all, still rebuilding from Vasco da Gama's attack two years prior. From here, they carried on to discover the port of Kilwa in modern-day Tanzania. It was a major trading hub, and here they took on provisions. Mombasa was skipped entirely. It wasn't until they arrived at Malindi on August 2nd that they got a somewhat lukewarm reception. Now, curiously enough, a chronicler mentioned at that time that scurvy was beginning, but he also noted that those who ate oranges and other fruits made the sickness abate, which was a pretty impressive insight. From Malindi, they crossed the Indian Ocean with a strong wind at their back, a lesson that they had learned from the voyage of Vasco da Gama. The trip across was relatively quick and uneventful. Cabral made landfall at Anjadiva Island in midsummer, which was known as a place to take on water. Here they waited for two weeks to ambush Muslim shipping coming in from Arabia, but when none showed up, it was time to move on. On September 13, 1500, the Portuguese Armada arrived at Calicut. By now, the old Samudri, who Vasco da Gama had met, had passed on. He was replaced by his nephew, a younger Samudri, who was much more eager to engage in trade. 
Despite this, negotiations were erratic and strained. But once both sides had arrived at the negotiating table, Cabral jumped into action. He presented the King of Calicut his letter of introduction from King Manuel, along with extremely lavish gifts of gold and silver. However, he also gave his list of demands. Now you gotta keep in mind that from the Portuguese perspective, they had been appointed by the Pope to come to the Indian Ocean to firmly establish trade, gain allies, and wage holy war against Islam. Cabral thus demanded restitution of goods that Vasco da Gama had left behind, a low cost to all spices, a secure trading outpost in Calicut, preferential tax tariffs, and that all Muslims were to be banished. An exceedingly tall, if not impossible, order. To top it all off, the Portuguese also insisted that they were to be unhindered as they attacked Arab shipping. It took two and a half months of negotiations that were tainted with aggressive stances and confrontational posturing to secure some of these mandates. But eventually it worked out. In time, a Portuguese trading outpost went up in the city, being built into a series of houses that lined the waterfront. Despite this success, Pedro Cabral was not satisfied. He knew that something sinister was in the works. The negotiations between the Portuguese and the Samudri were done with Muslim intermediary translators. This was a major breach in security. Any transaction, any conversation would be readily known to the Muslim traders of the city. Cabral knew that they could not be trusted. He feared that his Islamic competitors were busy poisoning the mind of the King of Calicut against him. What made it even more suspicious was that after three months at port, only two of his ships had been filled with spice. Something must have been obstructing the process. In that same time, Arab traders had come and gone with their cargo holds full. Cabral bitterly complained to the Zamorin, who at this point was caught between two rival factions that were growing more hostile towards one another by the day. Finally, in December of 1500, the King of Calicut grudgingly acquiesced to the Portuguese demand to hunt down Muslim shipping on the high seas. Cabral now had his green light. He simply waited for an opportunity. It just so happened that a few days later, a rich Muslim merchant ship destined for the port of Jeddah departed. The Portuguese armada raced in. They captured the vessel, took its cargo, and killed most of the crew. That building hostility that had been reaching a breaking point between Christian and Muslim was now ready to explode. In the book, The Conquerors, Crowley recounts the Muslim response. Quote, a mob began to gather in the city streets. Together, they moved towards the Portuguese trading outpost. There were about 70 men from the ships in the town armed with swords and shields trying to resist the attack against the mob, who were described as being innumerable. The Portuguese were forced back inside the building, which was surrounded by a wall as tall as a man on horseback. They managed to shut the outer gate. From the wall, they fired crossbows, killing a fair number of people. From the building's roof, they hoisted a banner as a distress signal to the ships. Cabral dispatched longboats armed with swivel guns to disperse the crowd. This had no effect. The Muslim crowd began to destroy the outer wall so that in the space of an hour, they raised it completely. The defenders were now penned inside, shooting from the windows. The commander decided that further resistance was useless. Their best hope was to make a break for the shore. Bursting out of the house, most of them managed to reach the beach. To their dismay, the boats were holding back, not daring to approach in rough sea. The armed mob closed in. Despite there being just a few survivors, most of the men of Portugal that night were hacked to pieces. End quote. Cabral and his men watched as their outpost was reduced to cinders and their countrymen were slaughtered right in front of them. A day went by awaiting a response from the King of Calicut about the attack. The Zamorin had no idea how to respond that would be equitable to both sides. He opted to say nothing. Thus, it was time for Portugal to respond. Cabral unleashed his armada on the 10 Muslim ships in the harbor of Calicut. He may have been outnumbered, but that day, Portuguese cannon reigned supreme. Some of the ships were taken, their crews were executed, and their bodies were thrown into the water. The ships that attempted to escape were reduced to burning driftwood by Portuguese gunfire. 
The people of Calicut could only watch on with horror at the unfolding carnage before them. The fighting continued well into the night, and yet there was still no response from the Zamorin. For Cabral and his men, this only meant that the Samudri was a Muslim agent, and thus he too would need to be taught a lesson. The very next morning, the Portuguese ships were towed as close to the city as their longboats would allow. Every cannon was brought to bear on the city. Meanwhile, a massive crowd had gathered on the beaches to salvage what they could. They were positioned directly in front of the ships. Cabral then gave the order to fire, and what followed was a momentous fleet-wide broadside that pummeled everything before it. Nigel Cliff in The Last Crusade describes the scene, quote, Cannonballs plowed into the crowds on the seafront and tore through houses and temples, killing hundreds, if not thousands. So great was the consternation that the Zamorin fled from his palace, and one of his chief Nayars, who was standing next to him, was killed by a ball. Even part of the palace was destroyed by the cannonade." End quote. The bombardment of Calicut would continue for an entire day. Relations had now reached terminal collapse, a point beyond forgiveness. This would be the first major flashpoint of a very long war. The next morning, wanting to cut his losses, Cabral decided to sail off. At the advice of Gaspar de Gama, the Armada headed to the city of Cochin, about 100 miles to the south. Cochin had been a vassal to the Samudri and was eager to establish Portuguese relations, if for no other reason than to free itself from Calicut rule. Here, Cabral and his men stayed for two weeks, filling some of their ships with spice and establishing a Portuguese outpost. By now, news of the attack on Calicut had spread along the entire Malabar coast, and other cities like Kolam and Konur also sent in their delegates to establish contact. The Portuguese presence was clearly now a disruptive factor in the politics of the Indian Ocean. It was at this point that Cabral's mind was opened. Meeting so many of the local powers, it dawned on the Portuguese that there were not that many Christians in India after all. They were finally able to understand the existence of Hinduism and just how ubiquitous it was. This revelation was a bit shocking. Meanwhile, the Samudri was planning his revenge and had assembled a fleet of 80 ships to intercept Cabral on his return. However, when the two fleets met, nothing happened. The king's men, at this point, were too wary of Portuguese firepower and kept their distance. Cabral, meanwhile, was heavily loaded with spice. He simply ignored the threat and made his way past them to the port of Canor. The king of Canor was more than enthusiastic to welcome in the Europeans and provided them a good deal on more spice. For Cabral and his armada, it was now time to make the journey home. Using the winds of the monsoon to their favor, they crossed the Indian Ocean with relative ease. This was a far cry from the devastating journey that Vasco da Gama had made just a few years prior. When they arrived at Malindi, a navigational error grounded one of the ships that was loaded with spice. It caught on fire, and nearly everything on board was destroyed. Continuing on the journey, the Armada spotted the port of Sofala, which was the hub of the West African gold trade. It would later serve as a major port for Portugal. At the Bay of St. Brás, near the Cape of Good Hope, Cabral left a message for any other Portuguese fleets in a shoe that hung from a tree, indicating the situation in India. It was in June of 1501, at the Bay of Dakar in modern-day Senegal, that Diogo Diaz was found. His ship was quickly brought back into the fold. Cabral's armada arrived back in Lisbon in the summer of 1501, but only in piecemeal. It had been scattered repeatedly on the last leg of the voyage. When he saw his returning ships, King Manuel had very mixed feelings. On one end, he was horrified. Nigel Cliff explains why. Quote, Europe's horizons were expanding at a bafflingly fast rate, but Cabral would not reap the glory. He had found no Christian allies, and he had not made a single convert. He had lost hundreds of experienced sailors and half his fleet. Of the 13 ships that had left Lisbon, only seven returned, of which only five carried any spice. He had let the merchants of Calicut destroy the Portuguese factory, 
And though he had exacted bloody revenge, he had failed to stamp out the rebellion. All told, he had not been bold or successful enough for his king's liking. It was a harsh judgment on a man who had been set an impossible task. But regardless, Cabral would spend the rest of his life in disgrace. End quote. King Manuel was undeterred. He put the best spin on this that he could. Pedro Alvarez Cabral was the first to take credit to stand on four continents. From a Portuguese perspective, his voyage had discovered South America, Madagascar, the opening of the Red Sea, and the ports of Kilwa and Safala. He proved that he could use the monsoons for his benefit, and the spices that he brought back sold for 800% profit, which not only paid for everything, but it also horrified the Venetians. But perhaps most importantly, Cabral's voyage made the King of Portugal realize the gravity of the situation. That is, there were very few Christians in India, and the spice trade was commanded by a Muslim monopoly. King Manuel decided then and there that the only solution to establishing a firm presence in India was the use of overwhelming strength. He would claw his way in. By then, a new and much more powerful armada had already been built. It was even bigger, 20 ships, 1,800 men, and all of it armed to the teeth. To some, it was even called the Revenge Fleet. All that was left was to put it in the hands of someone who was not afraid to use its destructive potential. Someone who already held a grudge. Someone who wanted vengeance. The man appointed to the task was a veteran. It was now time for Vasco da Gama to set sail again and unleash his dark side. 